All right, let's begin with our last session of the conference, our closing session. Yeah, I know. Oh, no, it's sad. Um, welcome to our roundtable on the semi-centennial of Man, Economy, and State. Um, of course, we've been celebrating Mises' great book, The Theory of Money and Credit, uh, at this conference with several designated sessions because, of course, it's the centenary of uh, the publication of that uh, very important book. Uh, but let's not forget that it's also the 50-year anniversary of Murray Rothbard's seminal treatise, Man, Economy, and State. And by the way, I'm already planning the centenary sessions on Man, Economy, Economy and State for the 2062 <laughs> Austrian Scholars Conference, so uh, please send me your proposals, and I'll consider them for, uh, for those sessions. Uh, you know, uh, man, economy, and state has a widely acknowledged place in the Austrian canon. Uh, but even, even some of the book's admirers uh, tend to regard it not so much as an original theoretical contribution, but as sort of a, a, you know, a more systematic, uh, more carefully exposited um, version of Mises' human action. In other words, seeing the book more as, seeing the treatise more as a textbook than as an original scholarly contribution. Um, now, it's certainly true that when Murray Rothbard, oh, thank you very much. It's true that when Murray Rothbard began working on the book, he tells us, um, in the, the late 1950s, he had in mind to make a version of Mises' economics that would be more accessible to the non-specialist reader. As you know, the, uh, manica, uh, sorry, Human Action is by no means an easy book, and Mises assumes a great deal of knowledge on the part of the reader uh, to make sense of Mises' arguments. And Rothbard thought it would be useful to fill in some of those gaps to lay things out in a more systematic fashion, and he originally imagined a, a, a relatively short book that would be a suitable introductory text uh, for college courses. Of course, as he began to work on the project, he quickly realized uh, that something like that was, was, was not feasible. Um, while Mises had laid out the foundations and many of the applications of his mature theoretical system, Mises had left many gaps in his treatment on important issues. Uh, Mises did not provide a, a very detailed account of the pricing process, for example. Uh, Rothbard saw uh, an opportunity to integrate the price theory of the Austrian economist through Mises with uh, the contributions of many other important economists, causal realist economists, who had not uh, been, uh, who had been somewhat neglected uh, by, uh, uh, by Austrians, such as uh, Fetter and Davenport and Wicksteed and, and J.B. Clark and so forth. Um, also, there's not a very systematic treatment of the capital structure uh, in human action. It's somewhat, somewhat unsystematic, somewhat uh, uh, um, remarks are scattered throughout various parts of the book. Um, so what uh, Murray Rothbard ended up producing was not only a systematic exposition uh, and critique of previous views, existing views, both within the Austrian and the neoclassical literature, uh, but a highly original treatise with a number of innovations uh, in theory, uh, in, uh, in, in methodology, in application, in uh, analysis and critique of other views, and so on. Um, now, I, I should emphasize, and this is a, a theme of uh, a 2008, sorry, 2010 article um, that I wrote uh, called The Mundane Economics of the Austrian School. Uh, Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State is mostly about what I call mundane or what we might call plain vanilla or blue collar economics. Not a lot of esoterica in the book. Uh, in fact, if you look at the table of contents, there are 12 chapters of the original edition. Uh, all but two focus on the sort of ordinary details of value, price, exchange, capital, money, competition, and so on. You know, there's one chapter on methodological issues. Uh, there's one chapter on the theory of government intervention. Uh, production theory alone gets five chapters. Five of the 12 chapters are devoted to production theory. Um, even if you include power and market, which, as most of you know, was originally uh, was intended by Rothbard to be part of the book, 
but was cut out by the publisher and then only released several years later in 1970 as a standalone work. Even if you include those chapters, there's, there's virtually nothing in Rothbard's book about subjectivism, expectations, learning, equilibration, spontaneous order, and so forth. Um, and of course, this is true of the earlier Austrians as well, Menger, Bombavik, even Wieser, and of course Mises. Now, perhaps for this reason, some contemporary Austrian economists um, have sort of disregarded Rothbard's treatise as too elementary or too ordinary or even backward-looking rather than forward-looking. Um, in my article, I uh, deal a lot with Karen Vaughan's 1994 book, Austrian Economics in America. Um, she says, for example, that Roth Rothbard's book, quote, must have seemed to a typical reader to be more or less familiar economics, presented almost exclusively in words, with a few controversial definitions and some strange discontinuous graphs. In other words, not much original contribution and very little that would interest Austrians, young Austrians of the so-called Austrian revival. And I mean, it is sort of true that man economy and state is a little bit out of step with, with some of the other uh, contributions uh, post-1974 uh, within the Austrian tradition, works that dealt with exclusively with subjectivism and spontaneous order and equi equilibration, et cetera. Um, so what is the proper place of man economy and state uh, in the Austrian canon? What did it contribute to the Austrian revival? Um, what are its many innovations, and not, not only pedagogical innovations, but substantive theoretical innovations as well? Has modern Austrian economics fully incorporated uh, the, the, the substantive contributions of Rothbard's treatise? Has modern Austrian economics moved beyond man economy and state? Or does the book still contain important insights that have not been fully understood, fully implemented, the details worked out, and so forth, even within uh, the Austrian camp? These are the kinds of issues that our panel will discuss, uh, well, issues that we will explore uh, together um, this afternoon. So the way we have this uh, panel structured is in a, in a fairly informal way. So we have five panelists, Professor Salerno, Herbener, Rittenauer, Gordon, and Hulsman. And I'm gonna ask each to offer just a few minutes of prepared remarks, uh, reflections on the sorts of questions that I've just um, described. Then I'll give each of the panelists an opportunity to respond to remarks made by other panelists. And then we'll turn it over uh, to, to the floor for some discussion and some interaction uh, uh, between the audience and the panelists, between the panelists maybe even between the panelists and the moderator, I'm not sure about that. But uh, we want to make this a fairly informal event, so no speeches, no PowerPoint, uh, no lectures, but rather um, a discussion among all of us about uh, the importance and the, the continuing importance uh, of, this very, uh, of this great treatise in the Austrian tradition. So uh, I'll first turn the microphone over to Joe Salerno. Peter and for taking most of what I was going to say um, but um, let me start just uh, by um, talking a little bit about what I perceive as the place of man economy and state uh, in the revival of Austrian economics um, I've argued that actually there are two approaches or there are two views of of, of the Austrian revival okay which which occurred in the mid 1970s uh, there was a very famous conference uh, held in um, South Royalton, Vermont. It's come to be known as the, uh, the South Royalton Conference. Um, and that occurred in 1974. Shortly thereafter, in 1975, um, or, or rather in uh, 1976, rather, um, or was it 75 when Hayek received the Nobel Prize? 70, uh, 74. 74. Right, right. 74. So, so, short, so June was, was the conference, and Hayek um, received the Nobel Prize in 1974. Um, in October. And these two events together are taken as the beginning of the revival. Well, I call this the, the Big Bang theory of the Austrian revival, uh, that someone all of a sudden decided, hey, you know what, let's have a conference in North America on, on Austrian economics where there had never been one before. And so it's sort of like the field of dreams. Uh, if you hold it, they will come. <laughs> well, where did they all come from? Where did the 30 of us that attended, graduate students and young PhDs, I was a graduate student at the time, um, where did we get the idea that Austrian economics would be something that we were interested in? Well, 
my argument is that, in fact, the revival did not really begin in 1974. It wasn't spontaneous. Um, in fact, it arose out of, out of the, the publication of Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State in 1962. So let me just give you some background on that. There were actually three great streams of price theory. I mean, today, we, uh, in, in mainstream economics, there really are two that have been blended together. That is the Valrasian stream, which traces its, its, its roots back to um, Val, uh, the Swiss economist Valras, and then the, um, the Marshallian stream. Um, and they've been combined in different ways by the Chicago School, for example, by mainstream neoclassical price theorists, and so on. But my argument is that, in fact, there's a third stream stemming from Menger, and we have a, a distinguished Menger scholar here, um, Sam Bostaff, um, who um, actually got, my, got me very interested in Menger when I first read his article in the Atlantic uh, Economic Journal. Um, but stemming from Menger, uh, and that actually became very, very popular and actually gained worldwide acceptance up until World War I, okay? Many um, Anglo-American economists uh, Wick Steed, Fetter, Davenport, these are all great, uh, J.B. Clark, all great theorists that have more or less been forgotten when the Marshallian th uh, theory uh, or stream took over. At the end of, 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 for various reasons, after World War II, after World War I, in the 1920s, um, the, the Mangarian stream continued um, in, in, in certain places, for example, the London School of Economics in, um, in, in Great Britain, and at a few places in the United States, but it began to die out. Um, Marshallian economics, the economics of, of Alfred Marshall, a partial equilibrium approach, um, began to take over in the 20s um, in, the, in the US. However, on the continent, there was still strong Mangarian uh, stream. So there were three different streams. Eventually, by the mid-1930s, um, the, the Valrasian approach was actually brought to, to, to Great Britain and, and, and then later to the United States, um, by, actually by Hayek, who had Hicks read, um, J.R. Hicks read Pareto for the first time. And, so we, and, and then later on, Samuelson with his book. So my, my thesis is, was simply that the Mangarian um, uh, approach, the Austrian approach, was really poured down the Orwellian memory hole. People just forgot about it. It was never refuted. It was never exposed as, as being deeply flawed or anything of that nature. Uh, it was just forgotten. Now, Mises made a heroic effort between 1934 and 1939. He worked single-mindedly on, on his book, Human Action, in which, though people you know, tend to overlook this, a lot of it was devoted to reviving the price theory of Karl Menger. Okay, but by the time the book came out, um, World War II had broken out, at least in Europe, and the Swiss publisher who published it in German went bankrupt. There was no market in Germany. So the book was republished in the United States in an extended form as human action. By then, though, there was no market for it. By then, you know, Samuelson, Hicks, and so on, and also the Chicago School, uh, Stigler, had, they had taken over price theory, okay? So the Chicago School had pretty much followed Marshall, and um, the neoclassicals, combined Marshall with a few chapters of Ross at the end of the, uh, uh, the post-war um, micro textbooks. And that was it for a long time. And then Rothbard, out of nowhere, revived this, this whole tradition, worked on, on this book from 1951, and it was published in 1962. So to make a long story short, to, get back, to tie this back into you know, the Austrian revival, People began to read some of uh, Rothbard's, began to read uh, younger professors and, 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 and graduate students, became familiar with this work and began to read it. I read it in college. Um, I'm not going to date myself, but um, it was a while after it was, it was written. Uh, it was not a Kindle. No, it was nothing like that. Yeah, it wasn't on, it was on a papyrus, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, my contention is that to the man and, and woman, because there, were, there was one, at least one woman at South Royalton, and maybe two, everyone was a Rothbardian. Israel Kirzner, who was also uh, you know, one of the important figures in, in, in post-revival Austrian economics, had not written his great book, uh, Competition on Entrepreneurship, until 1973, the year before uh, South Royalton. It was Rothbard's books, and, and he had a few others that had come out during the 60s and early 70s, A Power and Market, um, 
uh, America's Great Depression, and so on. So everyone was a Rothbardian at that point. And now what, what was it in this book that differentiated it in price theory? Because that's what I think is the core of any economic system, is, is prices, uh, price theory. And, and, and a good deal of this book is devoted strictly to price theory. Um, basically what Rothbard did was to reintegrate price theory with monetary theory and with capital theory. Now, in 1963, and I'll, I've got about a minute or two more. Uh, in 1963, yeah, three minutes. okay, three minutes, um, Israel Kurzer published a book called, uh, and he, he, by the way, in, in the 50s was, was Mises' graduate assistant. He published a book called uh, um, Market Theory and the Price System. And it was a price theory book. And it was, it was a, 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 a thin volume, a, a typical, um, I guess, a length that, would, that any microeconomic book would be at, at the time. And he had some Wall Street insights in it. But it was, and it was just, it's just been republished by Liberty Fund, and it's been described by uh, its editors, uh, Pete Betke and Frederick Sauté, as very Stiglerian, that is, following George Stigler. And, um, and, and they try to argue in the introduction that, uh, in fact, it wasn't, um, it, yes, it follows Stigler, but it's really Austrian. And Rothbard, who wrote a huge memo uh, to the publishers, uh, pointing out that there were a lot of flaws in the book. Um, they claimed that Rothbard didn't understand the fact that he was using some equilibrium constructs that were consistent with Austrian economics. But that's sort of beside the point. What I want to do is, is just to read you two short passages from the review, which I, I, I wrote an introduction to and then published this year in Libertarian Papers. Um, this review, this was a memo that was written to the publishers. Um, so here, and you can see the difference between this Mengarian approach, which tries to integrate all aspects of human action in, in, in price theory, and, and the Stiglerian Chicago approach, uh, which Kurzer tends to follow. Um, and one thing Rothbard writes is, one fundamental flaw is the artificial and even disastrous isolation of price theory from monetary and from time um, phenomena. I know that questioning such isolation means bringing into question perhaps the very idea of a textbook devoted solely to price theory. But I'm afraid that this questioning must be done. The abstention from money is unfortunate but not fatal. But the abstention from time and capital analysis is. And this cannot be remedied by an appendix that Kersner promises us on time. This was before the publication of the book. Problems of time, capital, interest must be infused into the price analysis. As a result of the failure to infuse, Kersner ignores the vital structure of production analysis. Then he claim, uh, which he claims makes little difference to one's view of the economy. Now here's where, where Rothbard um, uh, demurs from, from, from Kersner. He says, the result of, of abstention from capital leads to all of the crucial errors of the cost curve analysis, which fills Kersner's book and is completely absent from this book, that is cost curves. Um, for example, it is the claim of the cost curve theorists, um, in, in the ranks of which Professor Kersner joins, that a firm will invest funds in production up to the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Um, and maybe I lost the rest of this quote. But he goes on to say that, in fact, that's not, not the case. If you look at it from the point of view of capital theory, everybody's looking to maximize their, their, their rates of return on investments. And when you infuse that into the price analysis, then the MR equals MC thing it doesn't work. I mean, it works, might work within the firm for, for batches of products that you're talking about, but everyone is continually searching the market to, to, to make investments where, where their, their capital is, is, is returning the, the highest possible returns. So the, the key is that firms are the capitalists. Firms are the ones that receive the interest return. Interest is not a cost under, under, your, under your cost curve that, that you're paying to, to some bondholder, to a stockholder. Stockholders and bondholders are the owners, are the capitalists, are the people who run the firm and disinvest and reinvest. So it's, it's a dynamic, forward-looking um, sort of price theory. Okay, I, I, and I'll stop at this point. There are many other differences and many other objections uh, <clears throat> that he has to, to Kersner's, um, uh, 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 at this point, as a manuscript. And I recommend that you read the article. Um, it's, in, it's, in the libertarian, it's in Libertarian Papers. And um, it's from this year. It's under my name, and I write an introduction, and then I, I, I reprint the memo. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go with uh, David Gordon next. Uh, yes, uh, Peter has mentioned that this is the 
50th anniversary of publication of Man, Economy, and State. And I remember very well when the book came out in near the end of 1962, and I read it at that time. It uh, came out, it was in two volumes it, published by the Van Nostrand Company. It sold for the enormous amount of price of $20. And it, a human action it was available in the second edition published by Yale University Press was $15, so this was $5 higher. And what I want to... I want to say a, a little bit about uh, what I think are some of the philosophical contributions of man, economy, and state. Uh, when Murray Rothbard attended Columbia University, uh, he took a course in philosophy of science from Ernest Nagel, who was one of the leading authorities at that time on philosophy of science and logic, and he Rothbard liked this course very much. His notes are available on the course, and he told me very much on how impressed he'd been by Nagel. And one idea I think he took from that course that you find in human action is the notion of, that Nagel stressed is the notion of an operational definition. And by that, what is meant is that in science, a term that's used in, in science has to have exact criteria for the use and application. If you can't give exact criteria for when the term applies, then it isn't a proper scientific term. And I think we see the use of this concept in several areas in Manny Cunningham's state. For example, in uh, chapter 10, the famous chapter on a monopoly, Rothbard rejects the notion of there being a monopoly price on the free market. What he says is uh, that economists can draw a diagram showing how a, uh, there is a monopoly price is above the competitive price, but one could never show in practice or no way of establishing that any particular price on the free market is a monopoly price. He said, why, if you said, well, the monopoly price, the competitive price would be lower than a certain market price. He says, how would you know that the price you say is the real competitive price isn't the sub-competitive price and the alleged monopoly price is the real competitive price? He said, there's no way you could establish this so I think this is an example of how he was using the notion of an operational definition and applying it to economics. Again, I think we see this when he stresses demonstrated preference, which he takes in a very strict way to be preference that is expressed in action, as opposed to the notion of revealed preference that's found probably most famously in the work of Paul Samuelson. In, in revealed preference, uh, there's what's involved is taking pe uh, probability distributions over various bundles of goods and seeing when the people or the chooser is indifferent between various bundles of probability distributions. In, what I, Rothbard's objection is, is, again, we couldn't demonstrate in action that someone has such preferences, and he takes only what can be demonstrated in action as acceptable for a scientific discipline of economics. And one last illustration of the operational definition occurs in, in the book where he's criticizing the once influential work of John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, The Affluent Society, which came out in 1958. Now, Galbraith said that he thought that a lot of consumer spending was wasteful. People were spending money on silly things like big tail fins on cars, 
when instead they should really be spent spending money on useful government projects. <laughs> uh, so what, uh, Ro what Rothbard says is, well, he says, Galbraith says certain spending is wasteful, but he gives us no way of delimiting what is the wasteful spending. So again, we have this demand for an exact criterion. Now he says Galbraith does appeal to the undoubted fact that as one gets more and more units of a good, the good will diminish in utility. But he said you can't use that point to show that there's waste because it doesn't follow from the fact that utility is diminishing, that the utility is diminished to zero, and the fact that the person who spends the money on the good is doing so shows that the good has positive utility for him. So he dismisses what Galbraith says as useless for science. I want to turn now to, I think, very important contributions that Rothbard makes to uh, get in, really, in, although the book is on economics, I think he, he makes very important contributions to political philosophy. One is he extends an argument that Mises had for criticizing various measures of intervention in the free market. Mises famously argued that one could uh, show that certain measures from the point of view of those who advance them would fail to achieve the ends that the, those people wanted. And Rothbard had some criticism of that. But what Mises was saying was, say, if you want, if you say you want to end unemployment, so you put in a minimum wage law, without making any value judgments, you could show that the minimum wage law won't get rid of unemployment. It will cause unemployment. It will hurt the workers it's supposed to help. So what Rothbard's extension of that was, say, in addition to means that won't achieve their ends, there are some ends that one could show are impossible to realize. For example, he gave absolute equality would be one such end. He said, uh, since people are in different locations, there are always differences between the people, at least some respects. You could never show that two people were absolutely equal. So absolute equality has to be ruled out as a possible goal, not on any controversial grounds involve appeal to a value judgment, but simply because the goal couldn't be achieved, as he says, it's praxeologically impossible. The last contribution I want to make is one, he makes a, a, what I think is a brilliant section where he makes a remark that applies to a type of argument for egalitarianism and against the free market that since he wrote has become extremely influential. That some people say, uh, John Rawls in his 1971 book, theory of justice is perhaps the best example, that it's very unfair that some people are much wealthier and earn much larger incomes than others uh, because they have superior abilities in that the, they, the people have these superior abilities simply because they're luckier. They happen to be born with a certain genes or they have better upbringings, better environment. So they are luckier than others. And what's called, there's a very influential school in political philosophy called luck egalitarianism that argues for redistribution <clears throat> on the basis that people shouldn't get uh, rewarded based on luck. So Rothbard has one brilliant sentence. He says, there is no natural distribution for luck. What he means by that is, until you specify some criterion for what the proper distribution is, you can't say that someone is unlucky. He gives the example, if you say that people should be, uh, get 
income in accord with their marginal productivity. It could turn out the people who earn higher incomes are actually unluckier because they're not getting <clears throat> their full marginal productivity, even though they're earning higher incomes than others. So the basic point, which uh, Susan Hurley had developed independently in a book that came out some years ago, is that until you specify a particular distribution, you can't speak of people being lucky or unlucky. And Rothbard anticipated that criticism uh, in 1962. And so I think that's one of his most important insights. So I think one of my most important insights is it's time to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, David, do, do you have any sense from the reviews of the book, uh, either friendly or hostile, that um, did anyone appreciate or recognize the significance of these philosophical contributions? I'm, I'm not aware of any anyone who's mentioned those. Really, no. No, I think not that I'm aware of. All right, thank you. Uh, let's turn next to Sean Rittenauer. All right. Um, although it's very clear from the remarks already made and for anyone who's read Man, Economy, and State that it is a... Uh, monumental uh, economic treatise, and in the a classical uh, definition, a great book, uh, that does not mean that it's not uh, very useful for teaching economic principles. And that's what I want to uh, comment on uh, today. Uh, a man, economy, and state's been very intimate in uh, my career, uh, intimately related to my career, uh, teaching principles of economics. Uh, when I got my first job uh, graduating from uh, Auburn, uh, I went and assigned uh, Paul Haynes' Economic Way of Thinking, uh, in large part because Murray Rothbard recommended that as a good book. And, but I used, or I assigned uh, supplementary pages for voluntary uh, reading um, and put them in the syllabus from Man, Economy, and State, and I lectured straight out of Man, Economy, and State. I once had a professor tell me that the secret to success teaching undergraduates is to assign them the second best text, but lecture out of the best text. Um, I, I, think that was, I think that's somewhat, uh, that was somewhat uh, facetious, but uh, it worked for me. <laughs> uh, um, when I, uh, when I got, uh, was offered the position at Grove City College, um, uh, Jeff Herbner was already using a Man, Economy, and State uh, as a, uh, for teaching principles of macroeconomics, and I thought, well, if, if our students at Grove City College could handle it, then I'll assign it for principles of microeconomics. And uh, the bookstore was swamped with orders. They were, they were sold out of Man, Economy, and State within a matter of, of a week, and they had to uh, uh, restock. But um, is, it, it, works, it works fantastic because although uh, it, 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 Man, Economy, and State has uh, the two things that a good, uh, a good economics text needs to have, a good economics treatise needs to have. Uh, one, it's readable, and two, it contains a body of economic thought that is both universally true and thoroughly realistic. Um, it is a readable, uh, that's one reason. Um, I remember that Gary Norris said that Murray Rothbard would never win the Nobel Prize, it's because he wrote with extreme clarity, uh, using logic. Uh, and, and then he committed the unpardonable sin of using italics when he wanted to emphasize a point. And so students, when you read Man, Economy, and State, you know uh, what he says, you know what he means, uh, you can understand what he is saying, um, and uh, on top of that, uh, because he builds uh, his economics from the premise of human action, the idea that people uh, engage in purposeful behavior, uh, you get this sense that the, the economics that is being developed in that book is not something that rests on the shifting sands of arbitrary hypotheses, but they are really um, uh, true. They are reflective of the reality of the way people actually live and actually behave. And um, for instance, uh, when, students, when students read through Man, Economy, and State, uh, perhaps guided by the professor, they see, for instance, that action implies a choice, choice implies the necessity of evaluation, evaluation implies concepts of uh, benefits and cost, implies the concepts of profit and loss, and so we, we, we get... Uh, all of these economic principles just from uh, our understanding of the reality of human action. And um, uh, I want to sort of piggyback on what uh, Joe mentioned about 
Rothbard's uh, treatment of, of price theory. Um, the, 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 thing, the one thing I liked the most about the book as I use it to teach principles of microeconomics was that, um, was that he uh, begins with uh, subjective uh, preference rankings that uh, manifest the law of margin utility. And uh, the, the idea that if, if, if you uh, obtain more units of a particular good, each unit, each subsequent marginal unit will be valued uh, less than the previous unit. As someone does this, that implies the law of demand. So that the law of demand is not merely, uh, again, hypothetical. It is something that is implied by the reality of human action. So it's something that's true. The idea that there is, in general, an inverse relationship between the hypothetical price of the good and the quantity of the good that people demand at, at the point of action. And just by way of uh, distinguishing this, I want to read, I want to quote uh, George Stigler from his theory of price. I came upon this when I was in graduate school as well. Uh, he, this is the way Stigler defends the, you know, Rothbard defends, well doesn't defend, he demonstrates the law of demand using human action and the law of margin utility that rests upon the premise of human action. Stigler says this, quote, how can we convince a skeptic that this law of demand is really true for all consumers? And this is, comes from Stigler's theory of price. Uh, that the law of demand is true of all consumers, all times, all commodities. Not by a few, four or 4,000 selected examples, surely. Not by a rigorous theoretical proof, for none exists. It is an empirical rule. Note, uh, not by stating what is true that economists believe it, for we could be wrong. Perhaps as a persuasive pers uh, a proof as is readily summarized is this. If an economist were to demonstrate its failure in a particular market at a particular time, he would be assured of immortality, professionally speaking, and rapid promotion. Since most economists would not dislike either reward, we may assume that the total absence of exceptions is not from lack of trying to find them. And that's, that's the basis of his defense. It doesn't get any better than that for George Stigler. Oh, I, I would argue that the uh, ex explanation of law of demand is much better uh, by Murray Rothbard because, again, he traces it back to the reality of human action. And uh, as, uh, as students read this and they understand how uh, the uh, laws of economics are not uh, something that exists in a, an ivory tower of uh, artificial uh, ideal worlds, then they they learn that they can have confidence in the economics that they are that they're learning. And I I think that we way undervalue that uh, that quality of good economics. That students are, are tired of getting fed uh, a, 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 a economic principles that apply if the constraints of this model also happen to apply. Uh, they want economics that uh, is true, and that is the kind of economics we get in man, economy, and state, the kind of economics you can take to the bank, uh, a 100% reserve bank at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one final point that I'd like to make, um, uh, a conversation about uh, using man, economy, and state uh, appeared on an economic blog uh, not Oh, a few months ago, and one of uh, the contributors to this discussion suggested that man economy and state should not be used uh, to teach economics at the university level because it will not pre uh, prepare them for the graduate school by exposing them to professional models. Um, and I actually uh, was able to contribute to that debate uh, in, in a small way by just pointing out that, look, at the, especially at the principal's level, at the beginning, the goal is not to train people for graduate school. The goal is to teach people how things really are. Right? And so uh, we build economic theory from human action on up to teach people how things really are. And then at the intermediate micro and intermediate macro uh, stage of your education, you can then expose them to alternate theories, alternate economic frameworks, but then critique them from, from a sound economic perspective and the... Um, the end result is a much, much more rich and, uh, dare I say, profitable uh, economic experience. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, are there, uh, f for the professors and teachers in the, in the audience, are there others who have used man economy and state as the primary text in an introductory course or an advanced course? A few? 
Okay, ter terrific. I hope that during the Q&A period, you'll offer some comments on, on I, how you found that experience. Can I make one more addition? I, sh I, sh I, sh I should point this out, too, that um, I'm, I'm still, although I don't use Man, Economy, and State as a text anymore per se, uh, because I, I use uh, my own Foundations of Economics book, the, the pedagogy, if you read Man, Economy, and State in my book, the pedagogy is, is drawn heavily from from an economy and state. And so I, I still see myself using uh, Rothbard's pedagogy and his economics as I, as I teach now for, I guess, 15, 16 years. Great. Thank you. Let's uh, turn it over now to uh, Guido Hulsman. In fact, my book is now the second best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's wise that you wrote it for that reason. <laughs> well, I was amazed when. when David Gordon mentioned that he still remembered the year when the book first appeared, 1962. I didn't remember <laughs> <laughs> this first publication because I wasn't there. <laughs> but I still remember how I first came across this book. So I had uh, heard about the Austrians, I had read some Hayek, and, uh, and that was in France. And when I returned to Berlin, I set out to, to study the Austrians in, in, in some more detail. I had a look at human action, wow, this was a very big book, so I just copied a few pages, what I needed for a research project. Uh, I had a look at ma uh, theory of money and credit, of course the good German edition, without <laughs> translation for errors. <laughs> and I had a look at man, economy and state. Man, economy and state was, was different uh, than the things that Mises had written. And uh, two things that, that struck out right away. Uh, the first thing was the, this, uh, this chapter in which, or the section in which Rothbard discusses property rights. This I'd never seen in economics text. What had property rights to do with economics? There's prices and quantities being produced and inflation or whatever and unemployment. But property rights? I mean, you're kidding me. This is an ideologue. It's obvious. <laughs> And then it was clear right, uh, that he, he set out uh, later on to, to uh, criticize government interventions, so it was suspicious because I was a good social democrat. I was uh, on, my, on my way of, of uh, healing, but was still pretty social democratic. And then there were these weird chapters on production. So in Mises, Mises' book, by and large, looked like a neoclassical book. So in, in the general structure, there were certain things that were different. But you had a, a big chapter on the market, you had a big chapter on, on money prices, and then a few remarks on capital, was a, a chapter on capital theory. Uh, so without going into detail, without reading it, so I, I just looked at the structure, it looked somehow familiar. And in Rothbard then come these three big, big chapters on, uh, on production, production the structure, pricing of the interest rate, pricing of the factors of production. This was also very strange. I say, this is a very, very strange book. And I put it back onto the shelves. And then I started off, and the first really Austrian treatise that I read and that I studied in detail was uh, the theory of money and credit. But I ordered uh, Rothbard's book and had it then seven or eight months later on my table. And then I started uh, studying Rothbard, and then it made much more sense after having first read Mises. And I guess that this is part of the, uh, reflects in a way, right, the difficulties that a typical reader would have when he first confronts Rothbard. It's just, uh, how would, would one say, well, it's, it's, in a way it's radical, right? And it's, it flies into your face and it, it's, it's difficult to digest, much more difficult to digest at first than uh, what Mises has to say. And this is not only because uh, human action, for example, is a much more mature work than, than many economists say, because Rothbard, after all, was just... Uh, 36 years or so old when he published it. Um, so in this uh, book, let me just, uh, as far as the book is concerned, let me just make a few uh, comments uh, on precisely those chapters dealing with the theory of production, which uh, uh, in a way it can be said to well restate Austrian capital theory. Uh, one reason why this subject has been dealt with uh, just on a few pages, 30 or 40 pages in human action, so out of 900, that's not a big deal. Uh, one, one reason was that Mises felt Böhm-Bawerk had dealt with this question in great detail. So Böhm-Bawerk had written three volumes on capital theory, so Mises probably felt, well, there was no, no need to, to add on this since 
anybody, any cultivated person was supposed to have read those thousand pages first because <laughs> he, he turned to human action. <laughs> so Rothbard did us the great service to restate this and restate this also in the light of the subsequent literature, especially elaborations coming from Hayek uh, and from, uh, from Mises himself and from also, also from the uh, American uh, Austrians, Feta. Uh, in particular, and of course Rothbard had digested Irving Fisher and all other works that had meanwhile uh, been written on capital theory, revising also the debates on capital theory and the theory of interest between John Bates Clark and uh, Böhm Bawerk, and also between Hayek and um, uh, Frank Knight in the 1930s. So all of this creates then uh, these three or four chapters, which are the most advanced statement of uh, capital theory, and I think they are still the most refined uh, statement of capital theory that we have today. I need to open another parenthesis to say something about the use, pedagogical use of uh, many economy and state, because actually I do use it in, in, uh, in uh, my classes in Angers, uh, because we are privileged to have a French edition. We have a wonderful, wonderfully translated uh, French edition. This is a great guy who translated this, Hervé de Quengo. And um, uh, so, so I'm, I'm using this text. But it's difficult for students of the first year. And the, the proper way to, to study man economy and state is to return to the book repeatedly in the course of one's studies. One cannot possibly expect that a student setting out to study economics in his first year, even, after you, even if you manage, if you, as, a, as a teacher, and usually you do not succeed, but even if you manage to get him through this book and actually read large words, it's impossible to expect that he would actually understand what he's reading. Uh, so it's a good book to, to learn economics, but probably I mean, you, you can be happy if the students just absorb the essential lesson. lesson. Therefore, in my, in my lectures, so I don't go through all technical points. It's also, for, for, as a matter of time, that's impossible. So you just focus on the essential points, right? The uh, value uh, process, uh, the pricing process, uh, speculation, uh, the fine distinction between uh, de uh, demand via exchange, uh, reservation demand, so it gives you a total demand, right? Then you have the distinction between supply and stock, uh, and all these things, and then eventually you get to capital uh, theory, and then my course is by and large finished, right? right once I'm done with capital theory. So this this is all you can do. And what you would have to do later on is to go through the same chapters again and then sort of say, slowly turn, sort of say, to the footnotes and uh, read also sections that you didn't read the first time. And this is the proper way to study, study economics. And in the mainstream, of course, we have a completely, uh, it's a complete disaster how economics is being studied because the little theory that you actually do is all done in the first year. It's, it's very superficial, necessarily so, because they are all beginners. It's very superficial, and then in the second year, there's no more study of economics at all. There's just a discussion of various models, modeling. And that, that's not being becoming more advanced. That's becoming more ignorant because you're moving away from reality rather than getting ever closer and ever deeper into reality <clears> as it should be. So this is a great thing about many economists say it, uh, and so it, it brings its full fruit only if you go through it a couple of times. And in subsequent years. So I encourage all of you who have this possibility, uh, maybe use in the, in the first year, maybe another text that's somewhat lighter, foundation of the economics or something like this, but then return to this text in the second year and also in the third year. Right? Have them read different parts of this in order to grasp the fine points of economic theory. So it's a great way to use this. So what does he do in, the, in these production chapters? Parenthesis is now closed. I, I will respect my time. So what he does here, uh, he, uh, he is, is, is the first of the Austrian capital, this, capital theorists writing after Mises. So in, for Mises, of course, he benefits uh, from the whole uh, methodological discussion, uh, methodological groundwork that Mises prepares. In particular, uh, Rothbard uses the evenly rotating economy. Now, uh, I do not think that uh, one, one needs ERE, strictly speaking, for economic theory. But when the ERE is a highly useful construct, the, st uh, the imaginary image of a static economy is highly useful for pedagogical purposes. Because it allows us to illustrate quantitative relationships between different uh, spending uh, streams, spending addressed to consumer goods as compared to intermediate goods, various intermediate goods, capital goods, and so on. Spending going on addressed uh, to uh, 
uh, original factors of production, labor, uh, uh, landowners, and so on. Right? So we can get this, and if we do not presuppose a static economy, it wouldn't make any sense right, to compare these different uh, spending streams. So this is what you need it for. And Rothbard also introduced uh, the, the crucial hypothesis that is very useful in this kind of context in order to uh, get to comparative statics, that is, for example, to compare a capital poor and a capital rich economy, you need to make the hypothesis that the monetary conditions remain constant. Right? So in order to have analytically to separate a variation in the savings rate on the one hand from a variation of the money supply. <clears throat> That's, of course, the, the basic methodological procedure that Mises had already chosen in the theory of money and credit, right, where he has in the second part, he discusses just the pricing of uh, money per se, money in the narrower sense, and then in the third part proceeds to analyze the pricing of money in the larger sense, so including fiduciary media. So you need to make this distinction. Right? And Rothbard is the first one to apply this to the uh, discussion, to the analysis of the capital structure. Uh, many years later, uh, George Reisman does the same thing. And uh, George Reisman sometimes gives the impression that he himself has in invented this uh, methodological device, where in fact he has adopted it from Rothbard 101. Now, I'm, a, I'm a great <clears throat> admirer of uh, George Reisman's too, but um, uh, it, it would have been useful for his, in his book if he had uh, uh, spent a few more pages just uh, uh, comparing his achievements to those of Rothbard in order to uh, just demonstrate to which extent he was intellectually indebted uh, to Rothbard. So we have uh, the right methodological approach, and the, on the, the basis of this methodological approach, we have then a discussion of the pricing process, pricing of factors of production. There's one, uh, to, to finish, yeah. Yeah. there's one uh, peculiar feature that we find in uh, Rothbard's uh, capital theory, which is the uh, deduction of the, uh, the pure interest rate in terms of Demand schedules and uh, supply schedules. Demand for present goods and supply of present goods. And this might uh, represent a difficulty, and I mention this because I just think of, of uh, George Reisman. So George Reisman insists and says, yes, the interest rate is not a price. That's correct, right? because there's originary interest. You can imagine an economy without debt. Right? All capital that's being invested is equity capital. And without debt, there are no debt contracts. Therefore, in a technical sense, yes, you have no interest. There's no price being paid for capital. That's true. But still, we would have originary interest in the Bavarian sense. That is, there would be a remuneration, remuneration of capital, remuneration of the savings that are being invested. And this is, of course, an, uh, a residual remuneration. Right? This is the, what, what is left <coughs> over of profits after a deduction of costs. Right? And so what Rothbard does is, that, in fact, is a very subtle uh, dis uh, discussion that brings these two elements together and shows us that we can derive, so to say, a remuneration of capital, even though there might be no contractual remuneration. But you can derive it from demand and supply schedules. Uh, so he closes a, a big parenthesis, right? The theory of interest is no longer something separate from the rest of economic theory. It integrates fully well in in terms of the same uh, basic <coughs> concepts, demand and supply, subjective value, as all other prices. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Guido. Uh, incidentally, your, your remarks about re reading and rereading Man, Economy, and State reminded me of something that Walter Block said in, a, in the previous session. Some of you were here about Ayn Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged. Walter said that he uh, first read Atlas Shrugged as a young man in his early 20s, I guess, and that he rereads it every 10 years to gain fresh insight. So he's read it eight or nine times by now. Um, <laughs> and w Walter slipped me a note uh, while Guido was talking, asking me to, exp uh, to identify the gentleman in the, the picture. We've uh, sort of going through a little slideshow of Rothbardian images. Uh, this is Murray Rothbard and his young uh, friends uh, in the late 1950s who called themselves the Circle Bastiat. That is um, uh, Ralph Rako on the left, then Murray Rothbard, uh, George Reisman, mentioned by Guido, uh, Robert Hessen, and Leonard Liggio. And you can see that George Reisman is beaming. He's smiling happily because Rothbard has just given him some insights in capital theory uh, <laughs> that he will use later. So our uh, last but not least uh, panelist is Jeffrey Herbner. 
Okay, as uh, Peter and Joe both uh, mentioned, uh, the core of uh, economics is price theory. And uh, I uh, propose to uh, talk for a few minutes about uh, Rothbard's treatment of speculation in the formation of prices. And to see how uh, distinct uh, Rothbard's treatment is, I went through some, uh, some other texts, uh, mainly uh, contemporary uh, texts, just to see what their uh, uh, treatment of speculation is uh, in the same context. And I started with uh, George Stigler's uh, The Theory of Price. I went up to the uh, library and I pulled uh, Rothbard's copy from his personal library. Uh, first edition published in 1946. And it's a typical Rothbard book. You know, everything's marked up, total thing, <laughs> everything, right? And you've got the <laughs> notes everywhere and everything's underlined and, you know, his egads and, uh, you know, shocking, uh, monstrous all through it. <laughs> Uh, but the one thing he did not find in that book is speculation. There's no uh, uh, entry in the index. There's no section in that book on speculation. In the third edition of the book, uh, in 1966, there is one short section, two, two or three pages on speculation. And what Stigler talks about is the futures market. Uh, if you look at Paul Samuelson's Foundations of Economic Analysis, 1947, nothing. Nothing in the index. Uh, no entries, no sections in the book. Milton Friedman's Price Theory, 1962, nothing. No uh, entries in the index, uh, no sections in the book. Uh, J.R. Hicks, Value and Capital, 1946, has three entries on speculation and no section. The three things he talks about are uh, futures markets, speculation in futures markets, like um, uh, Stigler. A second thing he talks about is how uh, speculation can be destabilizing in markets. It's self-fulfilling, so you expect prices to go down, then you, you change your demands and the prices go down, and then this feeds more speculation about falling prices. So it destabilizes markets. And the third thing he just mentions that if we're going to make models of the economy, we have to make assumptions about people's expectations in order to make the models tractable. Uh, Alchin and Allen's University Economics, 1964, has three entries on a speculation in the index. It has one section. The section talks about futures markets. Kenneth Boulding, Economic Analysis, 1966, has four entries, one section. In addition to talking about futures markets, he also talks about uh, this Hicksian uh, argument about destabilizing markets. And then he has a very interesting uh, discussion of speculation. I'll tell you why it's interesting uh, we go through Rothbard's treatment. It's an interesting uh, comment that he makes on speculation in a section he has on agricultural prices. And he says this, uh, this isn't a quote, but a paraphrase. He says, even if uh, speculative demand decreases price fluctuations in markets by making demand and supply more elastic, it thereby makes incomes of the farmers more variable. So he, he's again finding uh, bad things about speculation. <clears throat> uh, Man, Economy, and State has 11 entries in the index on speculation. It has five sections of the book on speculation. So it has three to four times as many entries uh, in the index. It has five times the number of sections in any of these other books. Now, when Rothbard... Uh, 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 theorizes about speculation, he, uh, we can usefully break his treatment into uh, these uh, categories. He first points out how speculation works for the individual person. The individual person is speculating with respect to the future uh, about his own uh, actions, about the outcome of his own actions. And then he, uh, the second category is the speculations that a person makes about the actions of others that he intends to interact with. So this is where we get the market. And within that category, he talks about speculation that people make on their own about what others will be doing in the market, predicting what prices will be and so on. And then he talks about speculation by the specialists in the market. So they're predicting on behalf of other people the speculative outcome of uh, even other people's actions. Now, the way in which this plays out in Man, Economy, and State is as follows. So we get this uh, first uh, point that all action is speculative on page six. Very early on, this is a 
part of the general theory of human action. It doesn't apply to pricing per se. <clears throat> but Rothbard carries this through to the section on pricing. So when we get to the section on pricing with demand and supply, he, he explicitly points this out. He says, look, both demand and supply are speculative. When a person has a preference rank and they say, I prefer an iPad 2 to $500, both those entries in the preference rank are speculative. The person doesn't know before mm. getting the iPad 2 and using it to attain his end what the realized value of having the iPad 2 is. He doesn't know until he gives up the $500 what exactly the opportunity cost is that he uh, uh, foregoes uh, in the future. So <clears throat> speculation is in the very uh, uh, formation of demand and supply. Uh, Rothbard makes this, he builds this into his pedagogy when he develops his um, uh, presentation of the theory of demand and supply with the total stock, total demand analysis. So here he's not just trying to show that prices must of necessity be determined just by preferences, but he explicitly brings out the speculative element uh, in that uh, presentation. <clears throat> So the conclusion from this, of course, uh, that he uh, arrives at is that prices themselves, both the level of prices in markets and changes in prices that come through shifting demands and supplies, both of these things are speculative. Prices themselves are not like facts of nature. They're results of human action that are based upon speculation. Uh, here he's uh, building on the point that Mises makes in Theory of Money and Credit. <clears throat> Uh, okay, now uh, to go on to the second uh, category where he talks about how people speculate about the actions of others in markets. What are we to say about this? Here's where he makes this point that uh, Bolding mentions. Uh, and notice again the, the date of Bolding's uh, economic analysis is uh, four years after Rothbard's work. So one wonders whether he's responding to Rothbard in this uh, in the comment he made, because what Rothbard uh, points out is that uh, when there's speculation, at least accurate speculation in markets, this makes both the demand and supply curves more elastic, right? because the persons will not supply or demand as much as they would have with inaccurate speculation. <clears throat> and the point, what he concludes from this is that any, because of this, any deviation in the price from market clearing will create these enormous excess supplies and excess demands. And as a consequence, the market will not deviate from the market clearing price. Because, because even the slightest deviation creates these sort of catastrophic uh, discoordinations among people. And so uh, this, this is actually a positive thing then in the market by bringing about market clearing, as he says, without trial and error. Uh, then he moves on to the latter part of the uh, speculating about other people where uh, he introduces the specialist, the specialist in, in speculating. <clears throat> and he says uh, here, of course, this is another improvement in the way that the market works because uh, uh, entrepreneurial ability will not be evenly distributed among all people. And so if we're just left in markets to our own speculative anticipations, you know, some people will be better at this and other people's worse, uh, not as good, they'll be worse at it. Uh, but specialists can arise in the market to take on the task of making these uh, speculations uh, for us. And if we turn them over to the specialist, then we'll get even more accurate speculations and even more uh, economizing uh, activity in the market. Uh, then the uh, last thing I want to mention on this, he, he carries, this isn't price formation per se, but he carries over this insight into production theory where he points out that uh, entrepreneurs are precisely the uh, specialists in speculation. And when they're forming their production plans, when they're making their production decisions, they're just doing the same thing that the specialist trader is doing in the market in forming speculations about the future prices that will exist in markets that they intend to sell into after incurring their production costs. So, so the very efficiency of the market in uh, matching production to our preferences is also depends upon this entrepreneurial specialist uh, engaged in um, uh, speculation. <clears throat> and then just one... Uh, 
One minute. J just one last uh, uh, point on, uh, on this. <clears throat> what he does with this uh, analytically, of course, is completely separate the production decisions from pricing decisions. Again, very uh, Austrian, very uh, uh, unusual, unorthodox uh, from a mainstream viewpoint. He shows that these two things are not um, wedded together in markets, but they're separable precisely because the entrepreneurs are speculating on what future prices will exist in markets when they make their production decisions. But the prices that exist today in those markets are set by demand and supply. So we can have a separation of understanding. We can understand the separation of the prices that are formed for uh, consumer goods today and the prices that are forming for factors of production, which are based upon the speculation of the entrepreneurs into the future. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Jeff, how do you explain the fact that many contemporary Austrians have charged Rothbard's framework as being sort of, you know, static, equilibrium bound, uh, not taking sufficient account of time, disequilibrium, subjectivity of expectations, and so forth? Just, just a simple misreading? I, yeah, it's uh, hard to explain. It's, it's so apparent as you read through it, and maybe if you're not sympathetic, you miss these things. I'm not sure, but it, uh, yeah, it's hard to explain. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me just ask uh, each of the panelists if you want to make a brief, Joe, brief uh, comment on um, <clears throat> so, uh, something the other panelists have said. Let's do that now. Yeah, I want to comment on Sean, because... Um, because Sean brought up a, a, a good point. Um, when I first started teaching, I went to a Murray Rothbard and I told him that you know I was teaching and he immediately interrupted me. He says, well, of course, you know, the whole point of, of teaching is to minimize contact with the students. So, okay, <laughs> that, was one of, that was one of his many laws. Um, but he discouraged me from using Hain. He, he said, ah, there's no, no analysis in it, Joe. It's no supply and demand. It's all, you know, just words. So he didn't, he didn't like, you know, he wanted analysis. So um, he, he used a, a series of textbooks. He, he never used his own stuff. He always used straightforward, standard textbooks. Um, and so he, he would use, he used Courtney and Stroop. He used the Roger Leroy Miller, uh, Edwin Dolan. Um, and, and, and he had a second law. The second law was that every edition of a textbook is worse than the previous edition <laughs> because it incorporates more of the, f the fads and flaws, but it doesn't scrape away any of the other crap that was in there to begin with. <laughs> um, so I remember him calling me up one day and he said, I found a great book. It's got a, the market for kidneys. He, he loved stuff that had, you know, market for drugs or kidneys or something like that. He, he wanted to entertain the students. But my last, my last point um, about him, if you want to, his courses were invariably a running commentary on neoclassical economics and, and its errors. And so he taught the supply and demand, he taught cost curves and, and so on, but he had very insightful comments in his courses that are, are missing from man, economy, and state because he doesn't deal with these things. And that is up on, on Mises.org, um, uh, his, his course on microeconomics, and then there's another course, I think, on free market economics, which incorporates some macro at the end. Right. And it's but, economic history courses, too. Yeah, but I'm saying, but yeah. just for the analysis, I mean, he was an analytical economist. I mean, he, he liked, you know, he liked graphs. He, he, he liked careful analysis, careful logic, verbal logical analysis. Um, he didn't like the Hain approach where you just tell a student, well, this is opportunity cost, and then you sort of talk about it for an hour. Um, he, he wanted the analysis in it. Okay. Anybody else? David? Oh, uh, well, just one point I want to mention on why some Austrian e economists tend to criticize Rothbard as too static or too oriented toward equilibrium. I think in some cases that uh, some of those economists have the view, they, they think we can't know anything at all about the future, and they have what, in my view, are very bad or no arguments for that view. And they overemphasize speculation to the point that they're denying all, they're really evacuating economics of any possibility of attaining knowledge. So I think the reason they think that is that they have to, uh, they extend the point about speculation beyond, the, beyond what it's worth. Thank you, David. Well, uh, let's uh, turn it uh, open to questions from the crowd. We have about 20 minutes, and we have a microphone uh, that will be available, so please uh, raise your hand. Right here. 
<clears throat> Hi. Um, so I fought my way through the book at high school. So I guess I misunderstood most of it, but I will, I will reread it. <laughs> but uh, there is something I always wonder about. That uh, when you read uh, Mrs., for example, its uh, practical conclusions seems to be minarchist. And uh, when you read Ruth Bard, and uh, he should be relatively similar to Mrs., uh, he uses strictly or very uh, methodologistic approach, and its practical conclusions are more anarcho capitalistic. So I wonder. It's, the, it's a huge difference in the conclusion, and uh, I wonder why, why there's such a big conclusion, even though it should be such a big difference in their methodology. David, you want to Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think the difference there is really a difference in economic theory or methodology, just a difference in really uh, political philosophy, and it, I think particularly Mises just couldn't conceive that uh, a society could exist without a, a, a state, and he just, I think, blocked that possibility out. And Rothbard, from his natural rights point of view, thought that no state was justified, but it isn't a difference in economic methodology. It's more of a difference in ethical assumptions, certain assumptions about how the world works, but not economic assumptions. Other comments and questions, please, Conrad. Yeah, this is for uh, any takers. Uh, if you were recommending this book to a student, say this is a great book, it has all these things in it. But uh, I would watch out for you know this one one point, what would you think of um, that um, uh, maybe, you know, since the book came out, um, something has, has been revised um, that wasn't quite uh, on track. Does that make sense? Right. So what are some of the weaker areas, yeah. uh, places where further clarification is needed or, or came subsequent? Yeah. Yeah. It, the, the, the text is, is of extraordinary quality. So there's, there's no, in fact, there's no chapter where I would say, I mean, this is, chapter is really complete, is, is off or is, is, is even bad or something or is, or is weak. All chapters are very strong. Right? But there are certain issues, I mean, sometimes it's a quibble, right? But it's, it's, it's even nothing that comes to my mind right now. There are certain things that he doesn't deal with, but that would have been interesting uh, too. For example, there's no comparison, uh, competitive, statics, uh, uh, comparative statics of the savings process. This is lacking. So uh, George Reisman, one of uh, George Reisman's contributions that he does precisely this, right? Uh, so there would have been other elements, right, that would have been interesting that Rothbard does not get into it, but we will excuse him because he has already delivered us 1,000 pages. <laughs> and, and they cut a few off, so he had to stop somewhere. Other, uh, Joe? Yeah, I, just, I would just say that um, there's been a lot of research since that point in Austrian economics, in Austrian theory. A lot of it's in our journal, quarterly journal of Austrian economics. Uh, for example, just recently, uh, maybe two years ago, uh, Xavier Mira wrote an article sh uh, extending the monopoly theory that Rothbard talked about into factor markets. So there are advances, and um, there are a few points where Rothbard um, was a little confused or a little mixed up. For example, Jeff talked about speculation, and earlier we had the talk about the different equilibrium constructs. Rothbard tended to confuse the basic moment-to-moment -moment equilibrium uh, on occasion with a, a Marshallian short run, in, uh, or, or let's put it, uh, sort of a, a fully a fully arbitraged sort of equilibrium. Every once in a while he'd shift back. For example, he would say markets, oh, you know, clear very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but the point is that whenever there's an exchange, it, in some sense, that has to be a market clearing price, even if it's a disequilibrium de price in the long run. Um, so, and and in the beginning of the book, he sort of says th that he gives you that analysis. But then later on, right? I think you've you've 
seen this too, Peter, in the book. Yeah, there are some inconsistencies. There's inconsistencies. Just loose phrasings yeah. and so yeah, on. His, he, his price theory, he, he went to Columbia and he learned uh, you know, uh, price theory using Alfred Marshall's text. And even though he criticizes Marshall um, extensively uh, in, in parts of the book, it, he lapses into sort of a Marshallian analysis on, on very few occasions. You know, another thing that's worth pointing out is, and is there's sort of two, there are two tracks or two lines of thought in the book. There's the main text, which I mean, as Sean nicely described, is you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of written for the ages in the sense that he's expounding truth without going into a lot of you know historical detail about history of doctrine or criticizing uh, other approaches. But if you look at the footnotes, the footnotes provide an amazingly detailed kind of commentary on the, the scholarly literature at the time. Very insightful uh, criticisms of neoclassical economics, of Keynesian economists, and so forth. Now, of course, the problem with that is that uh, the, the footnotes are dated, right? I mean, it's, it's it references to the, the cutting-edge mainstream scholarly journals up through the end of the 1950s. And um, it's, it's extremely valuable insight in there, but um, has the uh, disadvantage, of course, that it's, uh, that it's 50 years old. Uh, Walter? Yeah. Uh, actually, what, let's do Fritz first on the way and then Walter. Uh, thank you. Since you invited comments, I'll make a comment instead Please. of a question. Um, uh, I come from Francisco Marroquin University in Guatemala, and we were... Uh, basically brought up with the idea that uh, Austrian economics was a normal economics and uh, uh, neoclassical was a weird economics. Um, and from the very beginning, uh, when I studied there, we didn't really feel that we had a textbook. Uh, and um, Joe Kakaisen, that some of you may know, who was in the Mises <laughs> Seminar for a number of years uh, and who was my teacher, uh, basically put together the program using different readings from different authors uh, where uh, Rothbard uh, was formed an essential part of that program. Um, in uh, our experience, we tend to concur with uh, Professor Holzman that uh, it's uh, pretty difficult to digest Rothbard for like first year students or principal students in the same way that Mises would be extremely hard to digest for, for uh, starting students. Uh, our, our experience is that he is very good to come back to when uh, students have had some principles and then they've had the weird economics, which is the way we do it. We do Austrian principles or Austrian economics. And then we give them some um, standard neoclassical models. Then they have to come back. Uh, so um, they get kind of confused and we use Rothbard to come back. Another observation that I would make in uh, Man, Economy, and State is that uh, for someone who is trying to teach economics where students are supposed to like learn these definitions and, and regurgitate back what the teacher is teaching them, Rothbard is no good. Uh, and Hain is, for example, much better. Uh, for a more um, Socratic type method of discussion, Rothbard is excellent because uh, that's what he does. Uh, really go through a elaborate discussion of concepts as opposed to trying to teach like definitions and um, catchy words. So uh, we find uh, Rothbard extremely useful for what we call Socratic discussion. Thank you. I mean, I mean, a, a small addendum that occurred to me uh, when someone else was talking about pedagogy. Uh, you know, while Rothbard, when he set out to write the book, he did have in mind, you know, making Mises' ideas more accessible. But, but I think he he was thinking of the reader as sort of the the intelligent lay reader, not necessarily the college student. Uh, it might be worth noting that during the time when Rothbard was writing the book, he was not a college professor. He was a research economist with the Volcker Fund, and he did not have any daily contact with undergraduate students. He was not himself teaching out of a textbook. He wasn't teaching at all uh, during that period. So, um, uh, you know, he, again, his, his intended audience may have been uh, other sort of mature thinkers who perhaps were not as well versed in the Austrian school, but I don't think he had in mind the college student and wasn't sort of thinking about, okay, how do I get this idea across to a 19-year-old or a 20-year-old because he wasn't in daily contact with those with those folks. 
Walter Block? Now I wanted to, is this on? I wanted to say I had the honor of uh, once substituting for Murray as a professor. He was teaching at Brooklyn Poly and he had to be out of town for some reason and I took his class. It was a highlight of my career. Uh, I asked him what to do. He said, do rent control. That was my PhD dissertation. And I asked, you know, any specifics? And rah, rah, just go get them or something like that. I, I wanted to uh, correct Jeff uh, when he said uh, in Murray's margin, he had things like EGAD and Monstrous. He had that, but he had other things that were quite a bit more pithy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, somebody asked, uh, how about the weaknesses of Manning Economy State? And I forget what Murray wrote where, because I've read a lot of it and it sort of fades as to where I got it. But there are two issues where Murray himself changed his mind. One was immigration, and the other was um, IP. He used to uh, have the view, I think, that uh, patents were legit, but uh, illegit, but uh, copyright was okay. But then he changed to the uh, Kinsellian uh, view that. He didn't do that? No, no, much oh. so. I'm not a historian. <laughs> I screwed that one up, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to mention one other thing, and thanks for the correction, Joe. Uh, one of the things I got, whether it's Manny Commune State or somewhere else, that hasn't been mentioned that I thought I'd quickly mention, and that is his attack on math econ or mathematical economics, which assumes in, uh, very small changes. Uh, in order to differentiate a curve, you have to... Uh, be able to differentiate, you have to have infinitesimal changes, and infinitesimal changes are not compatible with human action. Uh, one of the uh, diagrams that I loved the most was this thing where if you have a U-shaped uh, uh, smooth cost curve and a downward sloping demand curve, it has to uh, be tangent at a point other than the, the bottom point of the average cost curve. So Murray had this uh, uh, U-shaped uh, 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 average cost curve with a little dip at the bottom of it, and then then you, the uh, demand curve could uh, uh, intersect that. And, and I just thought that was the cat's pajamas. I thought that was uh, the greatest diagram I'd ever seen. Stigler actually had that in his his price theory textbook. He he drew ja a jagged cost curve, and then um, he said this right. is more realistic. But then of course he goes on with the U shaped ones. Yeah. Please. Are there any uh, economic contributions of Rothbard that have been uh, maybe accepted or filtered the way more into mainstream. Particularly, I'm thinking about his monopoly theory. Have it, has it even been addressed or discussed, debated, refuted at all into mainstream? Not, not really. Um, but it was his theory, he took it a step further, was the, uh, the, the basic th uh, the theory that most American economists accepted well into the, uh, up to the, what's called the, the perfect uh, competition, imperfect, uh, monopolistic yeah. competition revolution. Um, so what he did was he, he, he took that theory and then he took it a step further and, 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 and um, but, but that, was, that was sort of the theory of Wick <clears throat> Steed and, and many of the early uh, American economists who were mainstream price theorists. And more generally, as, as I mentioned in the introdu introduction, if uh, about, you know, Rothbard was not simply drawing on Mises, you know, Menger, Bombavik, and so on. If, if you find upstairs his copies of Wicksteed, his copies of Fetter's Principles, uh, they're marked up in the more or less colorful way <laughs> that these guys described. But, you know, lots and lots of, uh, uh, in fact, I remember a remark, something like, I think it's something in Wicksteed. He says, you know, use this, like, use this in my treatise. So he was really studying the, the, some of the great works in causal realist price theory, which he thought he was, you know, he situated his work as a continuation of that tradition rather than as something that he was creating out of whole cloth. You know, I, I want to make a correction uh, to what I just said. Um, his um, uh, theory of the business cycle and its application in, in, in um, America's Great Depression, which came out the next year, uh, is now being cited and quoted from uh, by a, a top UCLA macroeconomist, Leo Hanian, has written two papers pointing out that the 1930s, contrary to what Friedman says, did not involve um, you know, a failure of, of monetary policy, but a failure of labor policy, that is, the rigid wages. And, and he, 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 he explicitly cites Rothbard. Uh, and that was one of them was a JPE article, and then there's a second article, an MBER paper maybe or something. Yeah. But um, that's a very, a very exciting development. Um, that was two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, GP. I'm 
I just had a question about, uh, I think, I mean, uh, I might be wrong on this, but Rothbard developed uh, significantly the marginal productivity theory of uh, factor pricing. I don't, I mean, I don't know if the earlier economists had such a detailed analysis of, uh, you know, within the, the firm and throughout the economy, the two different, you know, applicability of a marginal productivity theory. I was wondering if, uh, I mean, someone could comment on that. I'll comment on it. Um, he, uh, you know, that is the, probably the most neoclassical part of, of man economy state, and that's all to the good, because marginal productivity theory was developed um, in, in the U.S., you know, starting with John Bates Clark, and it was pretty much accepted throughout. Now, what had happened was after the, um, the monopolist competition revolution, um, cost curves began to come in. Actually, before that was Jacob Viner in 1926. You had cost curves beginning to come in. So now you have, as Rothbard points out, a redundant analysis of, of the quantity of, 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 of production, of output. Um, one stressing the, the, the combination of factors and using marginal productivity analysis, and the other stressing sort of given factor prices uh, and, and theory of the firm. So what Rothbard basically said was that the productivity analysis is right, marginal productivity analysis, and the cost curve analysis is at least redundant. Why do we need it? And it makes the further error of taking input prices as fixed, even though from the point of view of the firm they are, but they're never explained within cost curve analysis. So he was actually more neoclassical than neoclassical in that sense. Okay, I think we have maybe time for one more question. Anyone care to have the last word? I have a uh, quick question. I know it was briefly remarked on how textbooks be revised, and you know he was, he was sort of saying that every new textbook is is worse than the earlier edition. Um, and, and sometimes when you know authors they look back at things they write, they sort of say, "Oh, I, I wish I commented on this more, or maybe I didn't say that right." I don't know if, if you guys knew that any of his after he because he he had a very uh, productive career after he wrote the book in the early in you know in the fifties. If you ever thought that maybe like there was something that he didn't talk about, or he you know maybe he 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 would have revisited not not like a revision, but maybe he just oh I, I wish I elaborated on that more kind of in terms of economic theory, pure economic theory. Well, he was supposed to write a second edition. In um, when did the second edition come out? At first, he was going to revise the whole thing. And then he realized it would take a long time. His mind had changed on many things. And, and then he was going to write a ex very, very long introduction to it, uh, pointing out where he would say things, have, have said things differently had he knew what, mm -hmm. you knew at that point. Um, and again, he was busy with other projects writing his history of, of economic thought book. And so it just came out with a very short introduction and really no, no revisions. Um, we went through and uh, I went through and I found out I found some of the diagrams that were a little bit off and I, I, I fixed some of the diagrams but in, in in another edition after that but you know you, you don't want to touch his work because I don't know what what else he would have said yeah uh, though in in, in in talking to me you know he would say oh, I wish I said this differently or that um, but okay. you can only speculate so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, before we break, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to uh, thank the people who make the conference possible, um, the, the supporters of the Mises Institute for a generous uh, financial support, uh, Lou Rockwell, the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute, Doug French, uh, president of the Institute, Joe Salerno, uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Conference Director, uh, all of our presenters, uh, discussants, comment, uh, commenters, and of course all of you uh, for coming. So let's, let's all thank each other. <laughs> <laughs>